Hi, everyone. Welcome to this um, conversation. I think folks are still being let in, but um, we'll start because we like to start on time. Um, welcome to this third conversation of the I am here to wonder conversations that we've been having. Um, the first one, we're really, we're really so thrilled that so many of you, I see the names, uh, repeat, uh, you know, uh, fellow travelers in these conversations. Um, you were there for the, you know, the Kohinoor Kitchen Cook Along last time, and you were there for the Geet Gaya Patrone session first, and we're thrilled with this lovely response we've been having. Uh, welcome uh, back, and for those who are joining us first time, welcome. Um, the session today, the conversation today, will be about uh, the rocks, of course, and Dakhani art. Um, there's a lot, uh, one caveat, there's a lot that could be spoken about in this context, and we are trying to, uh, you know, have a conversation that is um, more focused on the Dakhani miniatures. So please keep that in mind. Of course, there's much more to uh, Dakhani art. There's the Kalamkari, there's uh, many other crafts, there's the Cheriel paintings. Um, and what we can do is promise that we are going to have more sessions on those. So please stay tuned to us and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get you that as well. Um, let me let me extend our heartfelt thanks to our collaborators in this. Um, you know, the Goethe Center in Hyderabad uh, has been with us from the start. Amita, we, we truly, every time we keep saying this, we're deeply grateful for the belief that you showed right from the start in this film and in this outreach that we're doing. So thank you so much, Amita, once again. Um, we're really, really grateful to the Salajang Museum for joining us, um, represented here by Nagendra Redigaru. He's the director of the Salajang Museum. Uh, Mr. Reddy will be coming on again at the end of the session and announcing the winners to two questions that we will be posing to the audience. Um, so uh, we're looking, uh, you know, to be able to uh, send you as a prize for answering the questions a copy of the Kohinoor Kitchen Digi Cookbook that um, some of you all also heard about last time. Uh, this is a cookbook of prize Hyderabadi, old precious recipes. Paul, could we uh, share that please? Could we have a share of that on the screen of the Kohinoor Kitchen Digi Cookbook? So while we wait for that, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, we, we, we will send this to the winners. Um, I'd like to also say that, um, you know, we will also send this to anyone who chooses to send us a donation to the film and the outreach for the rocks. There it is. There's the Kohinoor Kitchen Cookbook. Um, and this is what the winners will get, as well as anyone who chooses to send us a little donation of any amount um, that you would like. So, um, you know, uh, the film itself, it's been a wonderful journey that Mahanur uh, Yar Khan, who's here, who's the co-producer of the film and me, started many years ago, some seven, eight years ago, we started this Yaman, um, Mahanur. And, uh, you know, it's been a fantastic journey. And we're so thrilled, really, with the kind of response that this has got. Obviously, the rocks are beloved, you know, in the city and otherwise outside. And... Everyone we've spoken to has, had, has said this, that yes, you know, why aren't we doing something more about this? Why are we losing all of them? Why don't we retain what remains in the city? And that's really what this effort is about. Uh, we're in post-production for the film. We will be doing a big outreach with the film, free of cost, into the city, into every space that we can think of in the city, accompanied by a discussant. And so that is what this, um, you know, uh, this, uh, the crowdfunding request that I'm making now is all about. Uh, we need money to finish that and implement an outreach program. Um, this is this slide now are the donation links. This is where you could send a donation of your choice. Please be aware that you can choose not to, but we'd be very grateful if you do. The first link is in rupees, yeah, and it is through our fiscal sponsor. Big shout out to the Society to Save Rocks. They are our fiscal sponsor. They've been very supportive and you know, their love for the rocks is well known in the city. 
uh, with Mr. Narendra Luther, Frau Kadar, Aparajita Roy Sinha. These are people who've been working for the Rock forever. There are many more in the society, and we are grateful to them for their support. The first link is through them and as fiscal sponsor in rupees. The second link is a donation link in any currency. So if you want to donate in some other currency other than rupees, please use the second link. So much for that request. Please take your call as you wish. Um, moving on, um, you know, uh, I'd like to introduce Abir, who um, is a friend and who will be moderating this lovely conversation today. Uh, he'll tell you more about it as we go along. Um, Abir himself, please let me uh, read his uh, bio. Um, you know, uh, he is, as some of you all know already, the director of the Krishna Prithi Foundation in Hyderabad, as well as the Archi Association India in New Delhi and Leh. He has directed several documentary films and curated art, education, and community media projects. His research is based in the Western Himalayas, in Ladakh, Jammu and Kashmir, around oral histories, material cultures, and visual archives. His publications include The Visual and Material Culture of Islam in Ladakh, Discovering the Self and Others in Jammu, Kashmir, and Ladakh, A Sense of Place, Islam in the Western Himalaya, and Constructing Traditions, the Jamdani within exhibition practice of handicrafts. Um, so, you know, Abir is also a lover of art, uh, you know, more than all this, of course, in addition to all this, and we welcome him and we are deeply grateful to him uh, for agreeing to do this and moderating this session uh, for all of us. Um, and without much further ado, I will hand over to Abir and warm welcome to Kathleen and Navina. Uh, you know, uh, they know so much about this and we've been delighted to hear from them, you know, about these, you know, how the rocks have captured the imagination of our artists. And I'm sure you all will all enjoy it as well as they tell us more. Thank you all. Welcome. Over to you, Abir. Thank you, Ma. <clears throat> thank you, Manur, for having me. And of course, thanks to Goethe's Entrum for this fantastic planned event. Uh, before I start uh, my very, very brief introduction, I'd like to request everyone to please keep your audios on mute, otherwise we will, uh, and your videos turned off uh, so that you can view the slideshow and the speakers um, as we go along. Um, this uh, session is uh, uh, being conceived as a kind of a conversation, so please uh, put in your comments or questions in the chat box. We'll pick them up and we'll try and build them into our conversation as we go along. Um, uh, we would prefer if you if you wrote them in the chat box and did not uh, interrupt the, the the voice and the video streaming. Uh, so please uh, try to. Uh, you know, sort of cooperate with us on that. Uh, let me very briefly um, introduce the project. Uh, Mahanur has already spoken about uh, the film that is um, under post-production right now. Uh, these events are being organized to kind of build conversations around them. But the film, Other Kohinoor's, actually uh, attempts to explore uh, the manner in which the rocks of Hyderabad have become so entrenched uh, in the cultural imagination of the city. Uh, as someone who's moved in there fairly recently, um, it just goes without saying that you see them all over and it constantly makes you wonder, uh, you know, the sort of scale and the artistry in which they stand there, you know, the kind of imposition uh, they have on the city. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the rocks have also been a part of the cultural experience of the city for a very long time. They have been represented in visual and popular culture, music and cuisine. Uh, the, the two previous sessions in this series have been conversations around music and food and recipes. And Manur has just told you about this lovely prize that uh, people answering the question correctly will receive at the end of the show. Um, while uh, previous conversations have been about food and uh, music, we move today um, to look at the rocks, um, you know, almost as a kind of lead motif in uh, Dakni miniatures. Um, you know, it, it and Dakni miniatures themselves, um, you know, are, are sort of very, very special, both within the visual culture of the region and the world, uh, extremely well known. Um, and let me also just uh, sort of add that the following session that Manur will talk about uh, towards the end of our session today will be a session which discusses rocks around cinema. So we are essentially looking at how the rocks form a part of our cultural imagination and representation. 
But why are we looking at these miniatures? Why are we looking at medieval art histories? Um, because beyond some of the very highly evolved aesthetics, you know, a, a visual language, uh, which might seem a little distant to some of our uninitiated um, audiences today, actually provide us with a tremendous amount of historical evidence and reflection about a certain time and place. Um, it is not uh, just uh, about regional imagination and agency, but it also allows us to uncover these beautifully coded compositions and, and understand uh, a kind of pan-Asian interaction that was happening around aesthetics um, and art practices you know, in that time. And it also immortalizes several characters, so, so stories of people and spaces. And all of these, when we, sort of, when we enter this conversation, it allows us this kind of fantastic new perspective to our contemporary lived experiences. So I myself uh, look forward to this conversation and uh, at this point, I'll just very, very briefly um, introduce some of uh, two of our speakers. Um, both of them have had a sustained and engaged uh, uh, sort of interaction with these subjects. Kathleen is a professor of art history at the University, of, University College in Dublin. She has also taught at the University of California, Berkeley and at the Yale School of Architecture. She's the recipient of the 2018 gold medal in the humanities from the Royal Irish Academy which was the first time that the Academy awarded a gold medal to a woman. Uh, in 2021-22, she is scheduled to be the Alsha Menon Bruce Senior Fellow at the Center in Advanced Studies of Visual Arts at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Her books and publications include Architecture Since 1400, Minnesota 2014, uh, Modernism as Memory, Building Identity in the Federal Republic of Germany, also Minnesota Press 2018, um, as well as the edited collection Indian in, uh, India in Art in Ireland, which was published by Rutledge. Uh, from 2010 to 2020, uh, she has been a trustee of the Chester Beatty Library, which I'm sure she'll also tell us a little bit about uh, in her in her own words. Uh, Navina received her doctorate from the University of Oxford Oriental Institute. Uh, she presently serves as the Nasser Sabah Al Ahmed Al Sabah curator in charge of the Department of Islamic Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, at the Met, she has been involved in planning of the museum's permanent Islamic galleries and has curated a number of special exhibitions, including the Sultans of the Deccan, 1500 to 1700, Opulence and Fantasy in 2015, Treasures from India, Jewels from the Althani Collection in 2014, and Divine Pleasures, Rajput Paintings from the Kronos Collection in 2016. She lectures on Islamic and Indian art and also publishes regularly in scholarly journals. She has taught as part of the Curatorial Studies Program and supervises fellows and students, both officially and, and in an informal manner. Navina is planning a future exhibition on art in, from the Jahangis period. She's currently working on a book on Mughal architecture and is involved in several independent educational conservation and creative initiatives in the Middle East and India. Now, before we, um, we start uh, listening to Navina and Kathleen, uh, just a small interjection. Uh, Paul, may I request you to please uh, put uh, on, on the slideshow the image uh, around which we shall pose a small question for the audiences. Right, so um, as Paul does that, uh, this is a, a beautiful miniature titled Noble Visiting Saint. Um, we request uh, the audience to please uh, sort of type their answers out in the chat box. Uh, the winners will be announced at the end of this session. And like you all know that a copy of the Kohinoor Kitchen Digi Cookbook of prized Hyderabadi recipes will be mailed to the winners. Uh, Paul, are we able to? Yes. <clears throat> so that is the miniature which we have been speaking of. The, the question is, um, the audience has to identify which museum or collection is this housed in. So at this point, uh, with much, uh, with no further ado, let's sort of um, enter the presentation by in of the image. Yes, thank you, Paul. Um, if we can have the presentation, Navina, please. Sure, I'm um, going to share my screen. Okay, hope that's clear. 
Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Abir, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to all our friends at the other Kohenurs for this kind invitation. It's wonderful to be speaking about a subject that I first encountered many years ago when we were doing the Deccan show through the work of the Save the Rock Society in Hyderabad. So I'd like to really acknowledge how much they have awakened um, consciousness in the heritage of the rocks and made scholars like myself think about the rocks, truly uh, think about the rocks and their place in, in the traditional arts and the imagination of Deccani artists. So that's basically what Kathleen and I are gonna be talking about today. And it's a great pleasure to be in conversation with you, Kathleen. Um, and so I'm going to uh, launch right in with a slideshow uh, with pauses every now and then for discussions with my colleagues here. Uh, so thank you. And, and here goes. Um, the title Rocks in a Frame uh, was very imaginatively given to us by, um, by our colleagues uh, who are organizing this. And it's such a great way to think about rocks as part of a, um, you know, a, a sort of imagination and brought into dialogue uh, with other elements in painting. Um, and so this talk is really about, and this conversation is about artistic encounters with Deccani rocks, mountains, and landscapes. Now you see on this slide, um, the dramatic shape of rocks in the Deccan landscape on the left-hand side, where you find these great piles of rocks that are piled up in, in sort of incredible compositions coming up from the land. Uh, and that is really because these rocks are some of the most ancient rocks and rock formations on the entire planet. Um, and they're in great danger of being destroyed by the construction activities that are going on all over the country in that region. And so hopefully uh, we will be able to appreciate their importance uh, with all the efforts that are being made. On the right hand side, you see that there's a map and all the light gray squares that you see show you the deposits of related rocks around the world. And you'll see how rich the Deccan region of India is in these rock formations. These are some of the most ancient rock formations on the planet. Um, and so they have a very important history and story to tell for geologists as well as uh, people who live around them. And of course, artists and art historians. Um, on the screen right now, you see um, a wonderful landscape, um, a sort of mountainous uh, vista, out of which architectural elements are rising in and around the rocks. And um, this, this sort of um, response and engagement architecturally with the rocks is something that defines um, the, the long, long story of humans living around these rocks. Uh, in this case, you find that um, uh, builders from about the 15th century have built in harmony with the rocks where these building structures are coming out and around, but they're not destroying and, and dominating the rockscapes. In other, in other instances, you find that the region, the Deccan region has very famous rock cut cave architecture. Um, and these are some of the different ways in which humans have built and engaged around the actual rocky landscapes. But how stunning, as you can see, that, that vista is where the human intervention is, is very subtle and almost blends in with this incredible rockscape that you see ahead in front of you. Um, this view from Humpy shows a, a remarkable sort of long receding set of almost valleys and hills that are formed by the rocks all piling up and into these gentle sloping hills. Um, and again, it's a beautiful view and it gives you a sense of how um, the entire landscape is, is shaped by these rocky formations. Um, and the rocks sort of appear in clusters and then they sort of disappear. So you have sort of areas of greenery um, and then you have clusters of rocks and they sort of pile up in these gentle hilly scapes um, which is a very distinctive feature of certain parts of the Deccan landscape. And finally, you also find that there are rocks inside the rivers in, um, that are in, in the area. And here, for example, uh, you have uh, an incredible site, uh, which was recently you know, brought a lot of um, attention to in the press, 
uh, and there are several such sites, such as this uh, this one, um, which I, I've, I've given titles, and I hope everyone can see the names of the various sites on the screen. But basically, um, what what you see here are rocks that are within a river, and they have been watered down, uh, wet, weathered down by the forces of the water, and then carved on almost every rock is a symbol of a lingam. And there are about a thousand or two thousand lingams in just this one site of Sahasra, Sahasra Linga. But there are other sites like this that, that also, I mean, almost everywhere where there's an opportunity in and around Hampi for, for people to carve images into the sacred rocks in the rivers, you find that. So this is really just to introduce you to these incredible landscapes of the Deccan and to really ask ourselves the question, how did artists respond to these landscapes? And the art answer in some sense comes in two ways. Uh, one is that artists actually depicted and uh, ab absorbed these landscapes into their, into their works. Another one is that artists had received already and simultaneously a uh, formal pictorial tradition that isn't so much to do with observation, but is to do with conventions and painting. And that is the story of Sino-Persianate mountains and rocks that come from China to Iran and then India through the art of painting. So the interplay between the kind of observed rocks and the naturalistic uh, response to rocks around you, interplaying with the um, received rocks, if you like, or the formal pictorial traditions is sort of essentially what gives rise to the different dimensions of rocks in, in Deccani and Mughal painting. So um, in Chinese art, um, there's a very great tradition of looking at landscape and observing landscape. And you're looking here at a um, very early uh, work um, on the left-hand side um, from, from my museum, the Met, uh, which is from about the 11th century. And it shows a spectacular enigmatic landscape uh, in very pale tones of tall rocks, rocky mountains. And of course, we have to always make the connections between rocks and mountains. Sometimes they're indistinguishable. Sometimes they're fused together. Sometimes they're quite different. But you can see the way the, the, those rocky mountains seem to rise up. They gently sway uh, and bend in one particular direction. And that curvature and the articulation and the layering of different um, elements is something very characteristic of a kind of uh, Chinese treatment or far, far Eastern treatment of landscape. Um, and on the right hand side, you see that, that the Chinese tradition actually valued actual rocks as well. There's a great tradition known as scholars rocks, which are these beautifully shaped rocks, which look like those mountains, but they're miniature rocks. And they're often displayed as prestigious items in Chinese collections. And so I've shown you both of these items here, both the, the illustrated um, La landscape as well as um, an actual scholar's rock. And the means by which these images traveled were not just through painting, but also to, through the circulation of ceramics and porcelains that were very popular as exports from China all around the world uh, for many, many centuries. And we're looking on the right hand side at a work from the 15th century, uh, which is a, a dish with a uh, blossoming plum and crescent moon and a great rock. This thing that you see in the middle here is in fact one of those distinctive rock shapes. And on the left, you see an Iranian bowl with a similar, uh, with, with a sort of Chinese landscape. And I'm gonna turn over to Kathleen now to uh, add a few comments here, Kathleen, on, on the movement of porcelains. I think this is really interesting, Navina, that it's not the Chinese paintings that travel so much the Chinese keep those at home and appreciate it. But there's a huge thirst, first in the other Asian courts, particularly in Iran and then in India for these porcelains and eventually only much later in Europe where they begin to arrive in large amounts only in the 17th century. And so instead of having those very subtle uh, ink paintings, we now have uh, rocks in a brilliant blue because that's the color of both the Chinese porcelain and the copies of that made in ceramics in Iran. And if you go on to the next slide, you see what then happens in Persian painting. 
that the Persians take similar rock formations that they know not from the Chinese paintings, but from the Chinese porcelain and transform them by rendering them in these magical colors that are entirely unlike a normal landscape, although maybe this is what you would see at a good sunrise or a sunset. And here we have a, a miniature painting. It's actually quite large from a Shahnameh, the Persian epic book of kings that's in the Chester Beatty library, which shows you uh, Lal, uh, this uh, little baby being carried by this mythical bird, the Simurg, up to the Simurg's nest where Lal will be raised with the Simurg's baby Simurgs and be rescued. And uh, the figure of the Simurg, this mythical bird is also interesting. Uh, some of you may have, have seen it in uh, publicity for a, an exhibition of Harry Potter related material recently that was organized by the British Library. But what I really want to point out here is this transformation of the rocks from the subtle inks of India to the brilliant colors of Persia, because it is this tradition that will then be imported into India and into the Deccan. Thank you. Um, so, so I think we've, we've managed to introduce these fantastical rock formations in the uh, Persian tradition, which was the direct um, ancestor of the traditions of rock and mountains in the Mughal and Deccani painting traditions. Yeah. Now the artist in the Deccan who was most responsible, let's say, for a Deccani style is, is a quite a, is a character named Farooq Beg, who's somewhat enigmatic because not all the scholars have agreed entirely on his life story and his trajectory, but there's no doubt that he is associated with a Deccan vision uh, which evolved at Bijapur, at the court of Bijapur in the 17th century under the patronage of Sultan Ibrahim Adil Shah II, who was Farooq Beg's great patron. And we can understand Farooq Beg um, in these two paintings. Neither of them actually is, is formally attributed to him, but there's a lot of discussion. And certainly the style is something that we, uh, we have all agreed is associated with Farooq Beg's extraordinary vision where he has um, the ability to look into a mystical uh, subject into a kind of imaginative world um, and set it in, in a, an enigmatic uh, landscape or uh, outdoor setting, which uh, really enhances the theme of, of contemplation or of mystery uh, and of, and of um, the majesty really of nature and settings with the kind of internal explorations that a lot of these paintings are doing in terms of the subject matter. On the left-hand side, you have four um, uh, 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 sort of uh, religious figures with a lion uh, with wooden um, elements on his back set into this incredible landscape, which is absolutely filled with rocks uh, in spectacular shades of purple and, and pink with more sort of landscape elements and architecture and animals and so on. Um, we don't, I mean, that subject matter is still uh, being studied, but it might be an episode from one of the famous Persian classical texts, possibly one by Jami. Um, and another association is that it could somehow relate to the story of Saint Jerome, because we know that Farouk Beg depicted Saint Jerome, and Saint Jerome had an obedient lion that carried, uh, uh, you know, that is often associated with Saint Jerome. So these are two possible interpretations of, of the uh, work. Um, but that really gives you a sense of Farouk Beg's style, where he uses these rocks to great dramatic uh, interpretation in his works. I'm going to turn over to, to Kathleen to talk about the famous Yogini picture on the right, which I'm sure many of you will recognize, a Yogini holding a minor bird in this beautiful open air setting with gigantic lotuses uh, and flowers next to her. And this also comes from the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin now. And I think one of the, for me, one of the most interesting things about this is the contrast between a yogini with her ash covered skin and this really brilliant costume with the dupatas, the gold dupatas fluttering in the breeze and the swing of those being echoed in fact in the rocks behind. And we have these fantastic Persian style rocks again, but notice that they're not as many colors now 
although it's a very richly colored uh, manuscript page, and that they are beginning to form formations which are more recognizably like what you would actually get in a Deccan with the marvelous palace in the background. And what's also interesting to me about this is the history of objects like this. Chester Beatty, who was a mining engineer, somebody who really appreciated rocks. He made his fortune in copper mining in the United States and a second fortune in copper mining in Africa. Um, I bought this probably, we think in 1936. And when he moved to Dublin in 1950 from London, he, this was part of the collection he brought with him. We think from the frames of this, which you don't see here, the, the way it was mounted in an uh, album page, that it was probably, although made in Bishapur, probably uh, belonged at one point to the Sultan in Golconda. And quite often these were the kinds of presents that were made from courts to courts. Other pages that appear to be from the same, uh, from the same album ended up in a French collection in Lucknow at the end of the 19th century from there traveling to the collection of William Beckford in uh, Britain in the early 19th century and later in the 19th century uh, being acquired by uh, the Islamic collection in Berlin, one of their first acquisitions. So one of the things I think about that's really interesting about this is the way it's so much rooted in a place and in a culture, but it's so brilliantly painted and such an obviously rich object that it is very easy to appreciate it and what it has been, these works have been appreciated by people who are unfamiliar with the very specificity of place and culture that you see here. And of course, for many of you in the audience, this is your culture and you recognize it very well. Davina, back to you. Thank you. If so, I can just, uh, Abir. You know, the, you know, we've been talking about this circulation and, and like you mentioned, the, the bird, uh, you know, and it's uh, sort of uh, the manner in which Harry Potter uses it. You know, we, we kind of just, just to wrap up this one section before we move on into the next, uh, you know, we're talking about how these images have not just uh, moved around the world you know, in the manner in which they've gathered their aesthetics and their content and style, and then traveled from one place to another, such as these collections across the world, but how they've also traversed in time and continue to appear in popular culture even today. So while we spoke about Harry Potter, you know, the scholar rock uh, appears uh, very significantly in this recent Korean film, for instance, uh, which I think won the Academy Award for the best foreign film or something a couple of years ago. So the, uh, so much of these ideas and these, uh, sort of images, are they continue to be a part of our contemporary lives, is, is the sort of point I just wanted to make very quickly. Sorry, back to you, Novina. Yeah, for the next section. Oh, no, thank you. Yes, I'm so glad you mentioned Parasite, right? That the film Parasite. Yeah. 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 So, um, so I think, I think at this, you know, we've been introduced now to these kind of formalized, conventionalized rock formations that come from a Sino-Persian pictorial uh, tradition and were very well understood by artists such as Farouk Beg in the Deccan and used to great effect to advance themes that were meaningful in the, in the atmosphere and in the courts of the Deccan. Um, but now we're going to go forward and, and look more closely at these rocks. And we're gonna look at them in categories, some of which will make you smile and some of which will make you um, hopefully just learn about different ways of, of, of approaching them. This is a category where we look at epic rocks and we call them epic rocks, not just because they're epically huge and epic is now the most trendy word used by the under twenties, I think, um, but also because uh, they come to us into this pictorial tradition through um, epic narratives. And the epic narrative that we're talking about here is the Shahnameh of Shah, uh, in this case, a Shahnameh that was made for a Persian ruler in Tabriz in the early 16th century, uh, Shah Tehmas, the patron. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see the full page. It's actually one of the great treasures at the Met. And it shows a scene of the discovery of fire. Um, in this story, uh, as you know, the Shahnameh is the story of pre-Islamic Persia going back to mytholo mythological times um, in which the, the author Firdosi traced, um, combined these kind of early mythological stories with real histories and then uh, gave us a fantastic text um, 
that was then illustrated for many centuries by many kings. And so um, one of the stories right in the beginning shows the discovery of fire, uh, which you see right in the middle of that painting is a great fire. And that was discovered by, by one of the heroes who threw a rock um, at a dragon that was hiding amongst the rocks. And when the, he, the rock missed the dragon, the evil dragon, but in fact hit, a, hit another rock and a spark flew out. And therefore the hero realized the significance of this discovery and, and they lit a large fire and that's how fire was discovered. Now um, that's the subject of the painting that you see on the right. Uh, and the setting is in these remarkable, vivid purple, pink, orangish rocks with even blue rocks in them. Uh, incredible colors and sort of melting into each other. Uh, what's, what's really a hidden surprise among those rocks, which I was able to show you on the left hand two big slides, are the hidden faces that are to be discovered inside the rock formations. Um, you think you're imagining it, but when you look really close, and by the way, I've, these are small paintings and I've magnified them tremendously with the photography. But when you look really closely, you can see that, for example, below this deer's face in this rock formation is a little, what looks like perhaps a bear or a monkey, and then a human face. And then these very impressionistic sort of faces where it's not quite a face, but you see these uh, little possibly eyes um, on this side, on the left-hand side, you see, again, in the rocks below the trees, you can see a pair of faces and you can see a profile with a beard. And all of these little uh, outcrops here seem to have eyes. So um, one of the questions is, what's happening here? Why are the rocks themselves are filled with life? The rocks seem to have spirits within them. And these are, in fact, the ideas that were current at the time. Rocks were not seen as just dead uh, elements. Uh, in the literary traditions, they had all kinds of secrets and depths to them. And in the traditions, for example, of Solomon the Great, he is said to have locked the genies in the rocks and sealed them in there with his ring. Um, in, other, in other traditions, uh, you know, the rocks had, uh, you know, pr offered protection and they offered guidance and they offered, uh, they also locked up the enemies. Um, one art historian has actually argued that the enemies of the Shahs uh, were portrayed by the artists and their faces are all locked up into the rocks. So there are many ways of reading these interpretations, but what fantastic uh, surprises the rocks have to offer us. So if we continue into the Deccan, the Shahnameh became a popular text all uh, in the Deccan too. Of course, it is the story of the Persian people and it's, mm -hmm. its great currency lies in more in the Persian world, but the Indian world often produced uh, Shahnameh's uh, impressive ones. And this is a beautiful little manuscript that comes from Bijapur from the 17th century. Its pages are now dispersed in many museum collections. And we at the Met have a couple of them, as you can see here. Uh, here are two episodes from the Shahnameh. And as you can see, a simplified but quite beautiful type of rock has appeared uh, from that Persian tradition, the same colors, perhaps even uh, you know, more blended um, and a little bit more distinctive to the deck and especially the one on the left, that mauvey pinkish color. That's something that becomes very distinctive to the way Deccany artists do rocks. Um, and I have looked at the edges for faces. I can't find them here, but you do find them quite often in Deccany rocks too. Um, on the right here, you see the Persian hero Rustam, who's often identified by his uh, striped jama and his, his leopard head uh, helmet. Um, but, but I just really wanted to show you these, these figures in these rocky settings to show you how the rocks have now made it into the Shahnameh of the Deccan. Um, another epic tradition that we see here is from the Hindu epics that were translated into Persian, as, as you might know, for the Mughal Emperor Akbar up in the north and also had spectacular rocks. On the left-hand side, you see a folio, an image from the story of Krishna from a manuscript known as the Harivamsa, which in about the 1580s was translated from um, Sanskrit into Persian and illustrated. And here you see Krishna lifting up the entire Mount Govardhan to protect the villagers of Braj. And the entire mountain is a kind of fantastic rocky landscape with animals and, 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 and birds and trees um, and all articulated as a kind of 
great massive set of rocks. Um, and on the right hand side is a mystery object, which maybe some of your ob uh, viewers would like to take the time to pursue. We see two demons in the foreground and they are fighting over what seems to be the leg of a camel. Um, and they are set against a kind of green background, but in the further background, in the top half of the painting, are spectacular pink rocks, pink and purple rocks, amongst which ladies wander with, um, you know, water pots on their head. And this uh, scene has not yet been identified, but it has been attributed to the Deccan. It has a sort of parallel with the painting on the left. So we brought it in here as a mystery object, and Abir will tell us how uh, we, you can be contacted if you if you have an idea about identifying it, right, Abir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We, yeah, let, yeah, we'll do that later, yeah. Our next uh, section is called mystic rocks. So we've seen epic rocks. We're now looking at mystic rocks. And mystic rocks are rocks where, rocky settings where you often see scenes of spiritual exchange and enlightenment that are very characteristic of the Deccan. On the left-hand side, you see one of a, a very beautiful picture, which is now in Berlin, which shows a yogini on the right-hand side uh, coming to visit uh, a religious figure who's a religious holy man. He might be a Sufi or he might be a mendicant of un, you know, unidentified uh, affiliation. But the two of them are shown against this beautiful purple rock, which is that same purple color, you know, if you hadn't followed the trajectory, you wouldn't quite understand how this great sweep of purple exists, but that's what it's supposed to be. You can tell that now, you know, it's a rock or a rocky outcrop uh, with tiny little uh, blossoms of vegetal forms growing on it. Um, so it's a spectacular setting for a spiritual meeting. Uh, there are the two lions, uh, might be the same lion shown twice, being very protective of the, of the holy man. And on the right hand side, you see a painting also from, uh, the, uh, well, from the late 16th century, and this is made for Akbar. And the reason I, sh I showed this here is because you see a meeting between Alexander the Great and Plato, um, both of whom appear in the stories of the uh, Hamsa, or the quintet of Amir Khusro Dahlavi. And here they're shown in this, again, spectacular, a uh, rocky setting which forms the cave, uh, the famous uh, simile of the cave, which all of us have heard about, but here the figures are actually shown in the cave and this rocky setting and the cave becomes a place for spiritual and transmission and for philosophical discourse and for exchange in the story of Alexander and Plato. I know uh, lots of people in, in the deck and including Kathleen love this particular picture. It's a great favorite. It's almost characteristic of Bijapur. You see that the rocks here have been used in a man-made uh, environment. In fact, a little mazar or a, or a grave site of a holy man, uh, which you see on the right-hand side here. You see this little, uh, with the flags, you see that that is actually the, the grave of the, the holy man, and uh, which you ascend to through those rocky steps. And sitting there uh, is, a, is another holy man who is the kind of spiritual figure associated with the site. He's got very long nails, um, he's, as, as you often see, they, they have, and he's sort of dressed very simply, and he's visited by other figures who are from different spiritual faiths. And so what I think is wonderful about this picture is it really shows the nature of Deccan spirituality, where Hindus, Muslims, and people of different sects within Hinduism and, and Islam and Sufism met in spiritual exchange in these rocky settings. I turn over to Kathleen and Abir if they have any comments. I just quickly add that I think it's very interesting that at a time when Indian uh, builders were easily able to, to make very, very polished rocks, that a lot of the rawness of the rock has been left here in what in, in Europe we would call rustication. But I think that gives you the raw spirit of the rock and the spiritual power of the raw spirit of the rock coming through here very very well. 
Yeah, it's also like a, the, the what what you were just saying, Navina. That it's it's uh, the Deccan. We speak of the Deccan uh, as being such an amazing confluence of cultures, and that's exactly what we constantly see in the manner in which these uh, paintings have been constructed and conceived. I mean, it's such a beautiful confluence of colors, of aesthetics, of of ideas. Let's let's carry on. Yeah, let's okay. let's listen. Um, okay, so the last item in Mystic Rocks are these beautiful Bidri uh, wares, which are associated with the Deccan. And the reason we have them here is because you can see that in this extraordinary inlaid decoration, which is basically silver on a dark alloy uh, made with uh, zinc, which is why you get this lovely contrast of bright on dark, uh, you find that the rocks play a great role. Uh, you see them on almost every one of these decorative um, pieces. And what you notice is that the rocks actually are a place where uh, a site is elevated. And so the rocks play a role, not just as decoration, but as elevating a particular site in this landscape. So that's epic rocks. Now we're gonna go to the Rocky Hills of Mecca because one of the important things that survives at the Metz collection is a very rare uh, manuscript of a, of a book called the Futu al Haramain, which is the guidebook to the two holy cities and is, was actually made in the Deccan on the, on the, on the coastal, uh, western coast of the Deccan in 1687. And this is one of a, of a, it's a traditional guide for people who are going to cross the Indian Ocean and go to Mecca on pilgrimage. Um, and it was supposed to be very practical and tell the, tell the person what they were going to see. But also there's a great touch of Deccany imagination in this guidebook in that every opportunity that the artist had to elucidate the rocks and the mountains uh, were done with a great dramatic flair. So on the left hand side, you can see uh, there's, a, there's a sort of rocky outcrop. I'm going to show you details in a minute. Um, and this is the cave, the site of the cave where the prophet uh, took shelter between in his migration from Mecca uh, to Medina, the famous Hijri or, the, or the, the migration of the prophet. He hid in a cave from his enemies and a spider built a web to protect him and hide him during this journey. And that happened in this rocky setting. And on the right hand side, you see just mountains that the artist describes as difficult mountains that the pilgrim has to go through. And on the absolute right, you see that the entire holy city of Medina is surrounded by these kind of cheerful orange and yellow rocks, uh, which is basically the idea that the artist has given of how the city is surrounded by rocks. Let's have a closer look at those. And you can see that um, these rocks, like those Persian rocks that I showed you earlier, have little hidden faces in there. Uh, something that looks like kind of lionine and camel-like and all kinds of uh, creatures. Um, you know, the Loch Ness monster, you can find pretty much anybody in there. Um, and it's such charm and imagination. And the little titles tell you that, that they, what the, this one, for example, says Jabal As, uh, Asi, which is difficult mountains. Um, and this one, as I mentioned, is a specific site. So I uh, wanted to introduce you to the Rocky Hills of Mecca. Before we get to rocky love stories, because there's nothing more useful for a love story than a rock, because um, <laughs> all the challenges uh, can be so well articulated. Now, one of the most popular love stories that comes from, oh, sorry, go ahead, Abhi. Just, just, just a couple of quick uh, comments, more, more sort of housekeeping comments. Uh, you know, the, the image that Navina showed us a little earlier of the two demons, if there is any information that you'd like to share uh, about it with us, uh, Jonathan has just shared with us the Facebook page uh, of uh, the other Kohinoor's project. Uh, please feel free to get in touch with us through that. Uh, otherwise, there is the website. You could also reach uh, the filmmakers and the rest of us uh, through the email addresses provided on the website. This is also a, a, a time to quickly um, uh, sort of tell you the second audience question that we have. Uh, in, in, in a little later in this presentation, we will see a photograph uh, of, of a particular landscape which has already come before. So I wanted to um, mention that you should keep your eyes open and, and look uh, very carefully. We want you to uh, uh, tell us uh, which famous empire in the South is associated uh, with this landscape. Uh, the photograph is of Hampi. It's a view of the Mantaga Hills. Uh, we'll come back to it uh, and, and I'll just sort of point it out. But again, uh, please tell us your answers in the chat box uh, where uh, which, which, which famous South Indian empire 
uh, was established on this site. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Navina, for that interjection. Please, yes, let's let's carry on. So, um, okay, so we are in in the section known as Rocky Love Stories, and the the one that lends itself very well uh, and shows the role of the rocks is the story of. Um, Khosrow and Shirin, which is one of the stories written by the great Persian poet Nizami. And most of these, uh, these love stories, by the way, are really allegories, uh, are Sufi allegories for uh, the love of the human soul for God. So they shouldn't be taken too literally, but they always, uh, in, in the manifestations as stories, as love stories, they often end in drama and tragedy. So we have here the story of Khosrow and Shirin, uh, who Khosrow the king who fell in love with Shirin, who he saw bathing, the beautiful maiden he saw bathing. Um, and, and, but he was drawn away into other things. And while he was away, uh, the humble gardener uh, and sculptor Farhad, who you see on the left, also fell in love with Shirin. And then was challenged by Khosrow to cut steps into the rocks, uh, which he was unable to do. And so instead, he carved a channel of milk so that Shirin could bathe in this channel of milk. And what you see is this incredible uh, effort, the symbol of love that Farhad has carved from those rocks, from the mountain. He's carved a channel which is white because it's filled with milk in order for Shirin to bathe in. Uh, if you look at the rocks that are blown up on the right hand side, you can see the impressionistic birds and, and profiles again that give you the sense that the rocks are very much part of the story and they're watching over this this tragic romance. It's tragic because in the end, uh, Farhad kills himself, Shirin kills herself, and, and Khosrow is, is also left bereft. So it doesn't end very well for anybody, but this is, this is the sort of great famous romance of Shirin and Khosrow. So you see Farhad and Shirin in this rocky landscape, but this story comes to the Deccan, and when it's illustrated in the Deccan, have a look at what happens to the rocks. Okay. You, you have to admit that there's nothing like a Deccan imagination when it comes to rocks um, like this, because clearly those contrived rocks, those formal rocks are absolutely reinterpreted here with a kind of zest and a kind of uh, imagination and flair that makes this a very spectacular example of the story of Shirin and Khusro. In this case, you can see Khusro who's up on the horse and he's actually just viewing Shirin who's bathing by the river and he's seen her for the first time and falls in love. We have another example from the Deccan of the same romance, um, which is even more wild and imaginative in many ways because the rocks go across this page, which is in the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto, like, like treacle going across, um, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and melting and, and creating different areas for the narrative and, uh, and which you can enter at various points. And you see that this is an image of Khusro going hunting. So he's got his hunting party. And in each of these areas that has been sectioned up by the, by the, um, by the rocks, uh, you can see uh, leopards, you can see deer, uh, you can see a tiger, and you can see the hunters uh, in each one of these sections. And it's the rocks therefore become a kind of great narrative device uh, and part of the storytelling, if you like, of this romance. And if I so, were to add the, the rocks, look at the way the rocks almost flap in the wind, the way the, the flag at the top does. The energy about them is so amazing, even as they organize the space. Right, so, so, we're, so that's our little dip into Rocky love stories. Oh, we have one more, sorry, before we leave the section, which is the story of Ibrahim Adil Shah on the left who uh, is a great figure associated with Bijapur. He's the great um, patron of arts from the 17th century. And he's here shown in a very rare image with his uh, consort, who was a local Maharashtrian woman um, who, about whom the historical sources don't say much, but they hint at her and the paintings hint at her. But in this case, you see the two lovers in a rocky landscape. And it's interesting how the rocks in the background have this sort of sense of unity and duality, they echo the kind of two figures that you see in the foreground. Mm. So rocks of power are a different sort of use of rocks in the Deccan. And these rocks really tell you about the identity of the, uh, the rulers of the Deccan and the way in which these rocky di dimensions, rocky backgrounds um, are identified with power, with uh, 
with the ruler and clearly that the rulers take great pride in the great landscapes that they inherit and they own. On the left-hand side, you see Chand Bibi, who's one of the great figures of, this, of Ahmednagar from the late 16th century. From her time, there are hardly any pictures. She was famous for being a powerful woman ruler and for fighting off the Mughals who were trying to take over the Deccan uh, and had been trying for, for a good eight years until they succeeded. Um, but you see her here in the 18th century, there was a pictorial tradition that revived this idea of of Chan Bibi and it shows possibly on, an, on a lost original of the 16th century. But you see her here with a hawk and her attendants in a great open landscape, which is not dissimilar to the landscape that you see on the right. I, I never really thought about how these landscapes were actually not that far from reality until I put these two images together. And I realized that you can see the piles of rocks with those sort of flat green areas in between quite similar to what you see on the right. So uh, what a spectacular setting for a woman queen to be shown and what a sense of ownership and pride in that land, uh, which is something that I think we have to cultivate a real sense of pride um, and devotion to those landscapes and to the land. So that's, uh, and, and the, the, do you wanna say, Abhi, this is the question on the right? Thank you. This is the photograph that we were talking about earlier. Um, and the question was that which famous empire was set in on, on this site, you know, so I, I think that we have a couple of answers already. So okay. for the rest of us, please type in your answers now. Thank you. Yeah. Um, here's a picture at the um, at the Metropolitan Museum, and it's a fantastic painting which brings together the entire ruling family of Bijapur. In the middle, you see um, Yusuf, who is the founder of the House of Bijapur, taking this the key of legitimacy, so called, from the Shiite ruler of Iran, Shah Ismail, because at certain points the Bijapur rulers allied themselves with Shiism, and then seated on the carpet all around him are his descendants, brought together through time, all the way until Sikandar, who was just a child on the right hand side when the Mughals took over. But you see them all, all the nine rulers of Bijapur, and they're sitting on this, in this open ground on a vivid blue carpet uh, against a dramatic background of hills and landscapes. And e that gray area that you see in the background is actually the sea. And this is probably a um, view of the Arabian Sea and the idea of those mountains that go all the way to the seashore, because according to the Bijapur narrative, they were the owners of those, those landscapes until they lost them to the port. But uh, they never sort of pictorially accepted that loss because you can see that sense of ownership of the mountain beyond uh, into, into the sea. Now that brings us on to a rocky relationship. And the rocky relationship is that between the Mughals and the Deccan uh, and the rulers of the Deccan, because what eventually happened, as I, as I mentioned, is that the Deccan was taken over uh, by the Mughals uh, as part of a very long standing policy. Um, and the great sort of battles of the Deccan are not to do with local forces. Uh, the, those are minor battles. The great battle was really uh, uh, to do with staving off the, the northern takeover. Uh, all the different allies, alliances, including between Shivaji Dharatas and the rulers of, of Bijapur, were, uh, were established against the, the, the Mughals of the north. Um, but the Mughals were very determined and they were very brilliant. Um, and they also, in terms of the pictorial tradition, really represent not so much the loose and free imagination of the Deccan tradition that you see, but really the formal conventions of Mughal naturalism, which isn't exactly like European literal naturalism and, and, and it isn't very imitative of nature, but it's very serious in trying to scientifically uh, and accurately depict sites and, and places and natural life. Uh, and that was a great, Mughal tradition. And you see that in on the left in, in a painting from the Padshan of Shah Jahan, who uh, made his, who, who, who came to the fort of Dolatabad in 1633, Dolatabad being one of the important strongholds of the Deccan up in the north. And you see on this painting on the left, Dolatabad rising with that distinctive uh, granite um, base upon which the fort is rising. And on the right hand side, I was able to find a picture of Dolata Bad in the monsoon when you see that it's bright green, but you can see that it's rising up and 
I was joking with Kathleen, I said, it looks like a birthday cake um, because it's just so perfect the way the sides kind of rise up. And actually this fact was not lost upon the authors of the uh, Padshanama because they, in the quote, as you can see, this mighty fortification is in reality nine fortresses situated on a splendid granite mountain of the utmost magnitude. And so that's what you really see in the paintings and the photograph. And the point here is to show you how the Mughals engaged with Deccan um, landscapes and how, how a sense of naturalism is coming into, an observe, observation is coming into the Deccan landscapes. And this becomes quite the tradition as the 17th century progresses. And towards the end of the 17th century and the early 18th century, uh, you have a whole genre of paintings where rulers, usually Mughal rulers in the Deccan, are shown in these open landscapes with these distinctive rock formations, which tells you that it's the Deccan. And you can see on the right hand side what those piled up rocks that naturally piled up by nature look like and how they impress the artist as well. Um, but what you're seeing on a deeper level is something that goes beyond the depiction of rocks and landscape. It shows you that the Mughals are falling in love with the Deccan too. And that sense of ownership and pride is now being transferred to the new forces that are establishing themselves in the deck and they have been seduced by these landscapes and to pic picture themselves in these beautiful landscapes is part of what it means to be a great mogul of the deck rock music um, is a bit of fun here because um, these beautiful raginis uh, are illustrations to musical modes and the musical modes it, it are it's a complicated and slightly uh, abstracted tradition of transferring the idea living nature and the landscape nature are brought together as one uh, I think is really important here formally, visually in the work of art, but also something that we should remember, of course, as well, uh, that just because a rock we think of as not necessarily being alive, doesn't mean that it isn't an integral part of, of nature as life, the way these animals also are. Thank you so much. I will con I'll continue now to the last section of our talk, which is Hyderabadi rocks before Hyderabad. And this is really um, to, to show how even in the later Mughal traditions, and more so than ever before, you have a sense of, uh, of the rocks uh, and their importance in, in the story of Hyderabad. And the modern city of Hyderabad and the modern cities of the Deccan are so much less, I'm afraid to say, sensitive to the rockscapes, um, unlike the early cities. So let's go back to the early ways, what I say. Um, you have here on the left a slightly fanciful view of Golconda Fort, which many of you know from, from Hyderabad area. And rising in and around the fort are these uh, amazing mountains um, purple dramatic mountains rising all the way up um, and they represent the hills that are around and the kind of structures that are on the hills um, as an integral integral part of the landscape here uh, and this picture is in, in the Bodden Library in, in Oxford. Here's a wonderful painting that shows the environment outside Hyderabad. Um, it's a slightly strange painting because you have a very docile looking tiger walking around, walking along besides these hunters who are dressed in green as is typical. Uh, and they are all in pursuit of the deer that you see on the right hand side. Uh, and this group is set against a wonderful open landscape with rolling hills in different shades of green and piled up in these hills are these very distinctive rock formations. Once you see them, you immediately recognize that they have to be these amazing Deccan rocks piled up in the way that nature has brought them together. There are lots of things to enjoy in the landscape, tiny figures, birds, cranes, um, a lotus filled lake, um, and this kind of rolling uh, sense of rolling openness. 
And that is one of the, the sort of beautiful sort of open landscapes of Hyderabad. And the last picture in our presentation, the last painting to discuss today is, uh, you know, one of the favorites of all of us, which shows a, an, again, an open landscape filled with elephants set against a background of really dramatic looking rocks. And those dramatic rocks in the background look like a bit like elephants themselves. Um, you have the great profile of those elephant forms echoed in the rocky forms. You see the elephants in the middle of the painting are inside a kind of a wooden pen. Uh, then you see a number of elephants outside the pen with figures of different types and different activities. And as you follow them all the way into the background here, you see that they sort of recede and they become smaller in scale to give you a sense of spatial recession. And also to give you a sense by the time you get to the distant elephants about how massive the rocks are in relation to the elephants. So um, that sense of uh, harmony with nature, that sense of um, shapes and, uh, and the organic shapes relating to each other uh, with the inorganic shapes, um, and just the beautiful sort of sense of a harmonious world with elephants and humans and, and, and nature living together is a dream that is to be rescued, I think, and that we all have to join hands, I mean, together to make it happen. And the artworks really inspire us to do so because the artists have left us a legacy of, of beauty and of, and of a vision of what, um, you know, this beautiful environment was and hopefully will be benefits in the future. So we end our discussion with our message to save the rocks. And <laughs> we hope that this vision of rock, rock, story, rock music, rocky stories, love stories, and epic rocks and mystic rocks has, has appreciated the different dimensions of, of Hyderabad. I'd like to um, and Deccan. I'd like to thank uh, Kathleen and Amir and all of our colleagues for this opportunity to talk about the subject. And I turn over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, there are numerous conversations to be had, but uh, we'll pick up a few which have come up in uh, the chat box. Um, you know, we've been talking about the Deccan and 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 the Deccan painting and the Deccan imagination. But um, for those of us who are not uh, so uh, familiar with, you know, with, with, the, with the artistic production of that time, there is a question around why or how um, we see or not see uh, names of the artists. You know, we, we've been, uh, we spoke very briefly about Farouk Beg, but uh, would either of you like to tell us a little bit about, you know, what was really going on in the production of it? You know, there were these schools, courts, individual artists, you know? Ravina, uh, uh, Kathy, well yeah. I mean, I can say that, uh, you know, the, the question of artists' names, um, I mean, it's a very complicated story because artists at different points in different contexts sign their own names. In other contexts, librarians and other people, their names, and so we know but not. And a lot of the time, more time, there was no. So either you sort of figure out through the uh, process of attribution and scholarship to leave them as it is because in that culture and in that moment it wasn't about the artist the artists were largely anonymous and they were often in service of a greater ideal whether that was the subject matter itself or whether it was their patron um, so that's that's uh, the long and short answer but we do have now with especially with all the painstaking scholarship that's been going on um, we do have quite a lot of a corpus of material now about artists and uh, they're getting to be known. And if I would just add also that these are people who often work collectively and it's very similar to the fact that for the great uh, temples of this period, for the great mosques of this period, for the great Gothic cathedrals, we often have names of some of the people who were involved but it's not one necessarily one person doing everything. Those were collective efforts in which uh, one place the sculptor would do his or possibly her work, uh, and another place the master builder would decide how something was laid out. So there may have been one person who burnished the gold and one person who painted gear. It may not be that every brush stroke on a painting is by a particular person, and that was also true in Europe at the time, that an artist like Rubens 
uh, worked very collaboratively with a, a very talented group of the best people he could assemble around him. And I think uh, that uh, we ought too often focus on one figure and, uh, and, and really uh, a lot of great art and architecture is a collective effort. Mm. Well, uh, continuing on the same lines, uh, there are a couple of other questions. I mean, I know we've seen a, a, a very large cross-section, a historical cross-section of images, and it's difficult to perhaps pinpoint exact materials and colors and so on. But there is a, a query, and I was wondering whether we could refer to a particular piece, if you'd like to. Uh, but the audience has uh, wanted to know if, if what, what kind of insights we might have about the colors and the pigments. Um, Kathleen was just talking about brushes and gold inlay and so on. So um, would, is it possible that we go back to a particular slide or we can just take it in a more generic manner in terms of the colors and the pigments that were being used? And uh, another question, let me just pose it uh, at the same time, is about the synthesis of styles. I mean, um, you know, this is, this is a melting pot of various, I mean, we began the presentation with the Chinese and the Persian influences and how they kind of get adapted and then reimagined uh, in the Deccan. But if, if you'd like to make any further comments about both the, the sort of materiality of it or the, the stylistic aspect of it, yeah. Well, I'll say a little bit about colors. And I think one of the extraordinary things about Takani painting is how colorful they are, because we've gotten you very used to the situation where you go to the paint store and you get paint out of a tube with uh, chemical colors that usually were only invented in the 19th century. And so, some of these colors, of course, are in fact themselves mineral. And Naveena knows more about that than I do. But I do know, for instance, that certain color reds became much more common once um, the, uh, they could be imported from uh, Mexico. Once uh, Europeans and Asians have trade with Mexico, then there's a new kind of red. Um, so these are the intensity of these colors take a lot more work in the preparation of the uh, those collective uh, uh, artist studios, then if you decide that you want to paint a landscape today, uh, you're not growing, you're not mixing your colors. High intensity is a lot more accomplishment than it might seem to us. You can just you know pick pixels on the screen. Um, this is really really quite quite something different. Yeah. Yes, uh, just to agree, yeah. No, I put up a painting here to, to show you all the different amazing colors that you have here. And each of them has a story of development as Kathleen said, for example, the green comes from malachite, which is ground and mixed with elements. That beautiful yellow comes from the urine of cows, which is a famous Indian yellow, whether you have to feed the cow mango leaves for a long time and then, and then you know, work with the product and evaporate and then sort of do things. The blue is often um, related to lapis, which had to be imported from Afghanistan. Uh, the reds have a variety of sources, some imported, some local. The gold leaf is a sort of expensive element. So yes, the colors are very important and each one has its own history and story. And the Deccan palette is very distinctive for being a Deccani palette. It, it really has also especially got this pinkish color that, that comes from the rocks. Right. Uh, I don't think we have um, any other questions. Um, we should move into the sort of concluding section of this event. Um, would, uh, I think I'll have to request uh, Manur and Uma to also share with me the winners um, of the contest, of the questions that were asked. And in the meantime, if I can request, uh, uh, there you are, Manu, yeah. Uh, we won't share the questions. Um, Uma will, she should uh, have given it to uh, the Nagendra Reddy. Could we ask the Nagendra Reddy to come yeah, on? Yeah, I also request, uh, yeah, Nagendra Reddy Garu to please, yeah, there you are, hello again. <laughs> yeah, oh, yes. the answer was given by uh, one of the lady. She was closely associated with Hyderabad. She had an association with Hyderabad. Uh, during 2015 to 17, she was in Hyderabad. Definitely, I think, uh, I'm sure that she might have visited Salatang Museum. 
Then second answer uh, by Ambika. Uh, okay, I also want to reveal the name, Rebecca Prosker. Uh, she answered the correct answer, Salar Jing Museum. And second answer is uh, Vijayanagar Kingdom. Uh, this is answered by Ambika Venkata Subbu. Congratulations to both of them. And thanks for giving me this privilege to honor us. Uh, thanks, Uma, for giving, for giving me this privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Okay, I think my job is done. This was a fantastic session. I'm buzzing with ideas in my mind, but uh, we'll have to uh, sort of every, every good thing comes to an end. And uh, Manur, will you take over from here with your vote of thanks and to conclude the session? Thank you so much for having Thank us. So Thank you so much, Abir. It's been an, an amazing evening, and I'm sure you all agree with that. I'd like to thank Abir for having held the session together, and Kathleen and Navina for doing such an amazing job. I think we've learned so much more about uh, rocks and the wares and the why pores of especially Dakani miniatures, which gives us an opportunity to look at them differently now. I'd like to thank Mr. Naginda Reddy from the Salar Jung Museum for having come on board and shared the prizes with the uh, participants and for the participants to having so enthusiastically answered in the chat box. The audience, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, I hope this is not going to be your last time for uh, the I Am Here to Wonder conversations. And we have an interesting one coming up soon. Uh, I'd like to thank the GZ technical team. As always, they've done an amazing job. And that is both Jyoti and Pal. And last, the other Kohenul social media team of Taimur, Ramsha, uh, Jonathan, Mina, and of course, Uma. I mean, they have been relentless putting out those uh, posts on time, being extremely creative, getting at each other's throats to ensure that the right words are used. Um, it's been quite incredible and they do this every time. I uh, would like to bring to your notice that all those who have uh, answered correctly, not only in this sessions, but in the previous sessions, will get a copy of the Digi cookbook, which has exclusive recipes from people from Hyderabad. These are families who don't normally give their recipes out. I mean, very uh, We have a slide the next session, please, uh, Pal. So the next session is Pathar Ke Asli Sanam. It's about our rocks in cinema. It's on Thursday, May the 20th. And we at present have Sham Benegal, Dia Mirza, and Nandini Reddy on board. And there will be a few others on the panel. So it's going to be an exciting session looking at cinema and the rocks. Um, all those who have come on board are from Hyderabad, even though they're not here, I mean, they moved out, but they're all Hyderabadis. Uh, so please do support this labor of love, effort with the film, the other Kohenu of the Rocks of Hyderabad, which we still haven't completed. So we need your help to do that. And also for the outreach program uh, to save the remaining rocks of Hyderabad. So do make a donation of your choice. Uh, we will have the um, links coming up as soon as I finish. And I'd like to thank all of you once again, our panelists, thank you all very much. Khuda Hafiz, Namaste, and good night. Thank you, good night. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank Thank mm -hmm. you.